J. Mike, any closing thoughts? <laughs> I had a joke, but uh, <laughs> it was another John. It was another John the kid joke. I was like, I'm just gonna let that go. I do that all the time. But sure. Uh, <laughs> sure. <laughs> no, I just let that one go. Steel Podcast. I'm Case Aiken, and as always, I'm joined by my co-host, J. Mike Folson. Welcome back, everybody. So happy to have you here with us. Yep, I am so glad to be back here, uh, although it feels like a dream or perhaps an imaginary story. An Elseworld story? <sighs> no, it's, it's a little bit more retro than that. And because it's somewhat retro, we are discussing a thing that has some historical significance. So what better guest than to bring on an actual comics historian? So we've got Alan Kistler. Hello, people of Earth. <laughs> <laughs> Alan, it's great to have you back on. Absolutely. It's great to be back on. Good to see you, Case. Good to see you, J. Mike. Yeah. So we are kind of sort of finishing up our conversation about the death and return of Superman by looking back at the OG death of Superman story. We're looking back at Superman 149, the imaginary story by Jerry Siegel and Kurt Swan. That was the death of Superman. Like it's it's the cover is the death of Superman. (laughs) (laughs) We're not burying the lead on this one. Like everyone knew 10 cents are getting the death of Superman. (laughs) I wonder that people freak out about it as much as they did in the 90s. Well, they definitely didn't have armbands going. (laughs) Yeah, it definitely wasn't the media coverage that happened in the 90s, because like the 90s, you had local news talking about it. You had CNN talking about it. And yeah, I remember the little flimsy armbands that came with the comic, all the different covers, because you had the classic cover and then you had the one that came in the black bag. You had the one that looked like a tombstone. And there was one like a tombstone? The cover itself was all gray and looked almost engraved. Uh, the S shield and Earth's greatest hero printed on it. It was wild. It's also just wild. The, you know, that being a quote canon, because what is canon with imagination, but intended yes. <laughs> canon story in the 90s. I mean, the ripples were everywhere. It was all across DC Comics. It was even in Marvel Comics. There was actually in Night Stalkers which some of you will recognize was a Midnight Suns title and was part of the supernatural revival that Marvel did in the 90s because Ghost Rider had been doing well. So they did Midnight Suns, which brought titles like Spirits of Vengeance and Morbius the Living Vampire and Night Stalkers and The Darkhold. In Night Stalkers, around the time of the 90s death of Superman, at the end of one of the issues, the vampire or quasi-vampire character Hannibal King in a little epilogue that's totally separate from the rest of the story, visits a grave that just describes as the passing of a great hero. And you see that Hannibal, cynical jerk that he is, is overcome with grief about the death of such a noble person. And it gives you little details on the tombstone that you realize it's meant to be Clark Kent. It's meant to be Superman. That this... Vampire in Marvel Comics somehow is also mourning Superman. And that was, yeah, 90s was huge. 60s didn't have quite the same ripple. (laughs) Nope. (laughs) Well, and the 60s, they very, very much up front were like, could you imagine Superman can't die, everyone? The end of the issue in question, it's very clear. This is an imaginary story. Superman will be back next time. It would never happen that he would actually die. Never. Never. Never, ever. (laughs) But it was still a a fun experiment to see, like, what Jerry Siegel, as one of the co-creators of Superman, would do telling the tale of how he would die and, like, how would he wrap up that story? And it is very different from the publicity stunt of the 90s. One thing that was really interesting about looking at the death and return of Superman comics was that it kind of felt like, hey, this is kind of like a victory lap of everything that the writers had accomplished in the Superman books between the Man of Steel relaunch of the series up until that point. You know, there's a lot of characters that they're interacting with. There's a lot of supporting cast that they're seeing. There's a lot of stuff about Superman's world that we're going into. Like it starts in Death of Superman, but then like World Without Superman is really dwelling on a lot of that. And then the impact of all the different stories that they had is where you get to the reign of the Superman characters. So it was fun to sort of see this, like, here's a roundup of all the Superman material that we'd gotten to by that point, which was like, what, like about seven years between Man of Steel and the death of Superman? 
which is crazy to say out loud, like where it's like it feels that's so small a time span. Yeah. But it wasn't that long. <laughs> like, <laughs> it was 93 and it was 86 when Man of Steel came out. So pretty quick race from that point to there. But this one also is a chance to sort of reflect on all the things that had been introduced into the Silver Age Superman world. For me, I've been very familiar with the story for a long time. It was included in the trade paperback, The, the Greatest Superman Stories Ever Told, which I got somewhere when I was like 11 or 12, which was a pretty formative book for me in terms of getting used to the larger history of Superman, not just the material that had been coming out while I was alive, but like really going back to old books. Great trade paperback included that, included the uh, Superman Red versus Blue imaginary story. It included all these like crossovers with Batman. It had the Futuro story, just great stuff like throughout the years. They were like picking some of like the finest individual tales that, that they could cram into it. First appearance of Bizarro, Lori Limerus story, like <laughs> tons of fun stuff. So this issue had always been in that like group of issues that I was just very familiar with. And it's pretty back to back with Superman Red and Superman Blue. And there's some kind of similar themes going on in the two of them where there's like reformed villain curing all diseases going on and, and other stuff. Although in this case, it's more insidious. But for the two of you, when was your first interaction with this story? So I think I've mentioned on one of your podcasts before or one of the many things that you've hosted that one of my great introductions to superheroes in general was Jack Burnley, who was a Golden Age artist. My grandparents knew him. They were friends with him. When I was first getting a little bit into comics, they were making a road trip up to Pittsburgh to visit Jack and his wife. And I went with them. And Jack introduced me to the ideas of different ages of comics, Silver Age, Golden Age, that canon occasionally changed. And he had greatest Superman stories ever told, greatest Batman stories ever told, and lent me those volumes. So I wound up in one of those volumes coming across the story as well. Because I had very limited information on Superman. I had seen the Ruby Spears cartoon when I was a kid. And of course, I've seen the Christopher Reeve movies. Comics wise, I had been delving more into Marvel at the time. But I had started reading the Death of Superman event because it was a huge event. And I was curious about this. Otherwise, what I thought was a perfect being, being vulnerable and all. So that had come up in conversation, I remember. And Jack, who had drawn some... Superman in the 40s and had drawn some Batman in the 40s, drew some great covers. Co-created Starman was the first guy to make a cover of Superman and Batman together. Just offhandedly mentioned like, oh yeah, Superman died before. And, and pointed out that it was in this collection. So yeah, I wound up borrowing that book and reading over the weekend. And it was wild. I was already familiar with the idea of what if comics from Marvel so that was another thing that interested me. Multiverses interested me, even if it was called an imaginary story as opposed to a parallel universe story. That was cool. I guess I would have been 10 or 11 at the time. So, yeah, long ago and far away. And Jay, Mike, when did uh, when, when did you first come across the story? <laughs> I think it was right around the time that I, I listened to your play about the villain. And you mentioned this as your inspiration. And I was like, hmm. And I read it over today again. And I was like, hmm, interesting. I see where this came from now. So that means that you have been holding on to that trade of the greatest Superman stories ever told since before the pandemic. What are you talking about, Case? I know what you're talking about. This is nonsense. What are you talking about? This is nonsense you're speaking, sir. What are you talking about? You know, time's a construct. Yeah, no, it, it, it's a lake. Hey, you know. What are you talking about? <laughs> Why don't we talk a little bit about the actual story itself? Like we said, this is Superman 149. It came out in 1961. It was written by Jerry Siegel and drawn by Kurt Swan, which is a pretty heavy hitting team yeah. in terms of production. Like Kurt Swan is infamously like the Silver Age artist for Superman. And Jerry Siegel is, of course, the co-creator of Superman. Mm -hmm. I remember when I was first getting very into the influence of the actual original creators and how much of characters were created by one force, but then a lot of what we knew about them and what we accept as the main qualities that make this character them came from later writers, later artists with Wolverine. Who really created Wolverine? Was it Len Wein or was it Len Wein and Chris Claremont and Dave Cockrum? Was it Len Wein and Chris Claremont and Dave Cockrum and John Byrne? Depending on what part of the canon that they added that we now think of as essential Wolverine, like, well, you can't have Wolverine without that element. And it was really interesting to me with Superman as I was getting more into it, how many things were still 
Jerry Siegel influence because even after it was no longer exactly his baby, didn't belong to him and Joe Schuster anymore because they'd sold the rights and, and all that jazz. Like, but he stuck with DC Comics and kept making all these later stories that added all these things to the mythology. So I kind of love that this first true exploration of the death of Superman and its impact comes from the guy who thought of it. And he got to be the guy to decide who would be the one to kill Superman. Would it be this big bone monster who comes out of nowhere and digs himself out of the ground because someone dropped him there and forgot about him? Or is it, is it Lex Luthor? (laughs) Yeah. For a long time, I didn't process that this was written by Jerry Siegel. Because there's such a reputation of like, oh, yeah, the Siegel and Schuster era, like the Golden Age Superman stuff. And then like it was not as widely known that Siegel came back and like was writing well into the 60s and 70s. Right. Often because he was not credited as the writer on these books. Like if you look at the issue, there's no credits in the issue for who's working on it. Kurt Swan, very obvious when he's working on a Superman book. Kurt Swan looks like Kurt Swan. If you're familiar with what a Kurt Swan Superman looks like, you're like, oh, yeah, that's a Kurt Swan Superman. But it's harder to tell necessarily if you're not familiar with who the writer is, particularly because the writing style has evolved. There's a lot going on in this world. It's very cool seeing how Siegel, having created the character in the first place, has rolled with so many changes over the course of the 23 years since the creation of the character, 38 to 61. Like there have been so many parts of the canon added, like so many things that came from the radio show sure. that have become super important at this point in the series. And so many things that were just sort of like weirdly emphasized or mutated over time to get to the state of the canon in 61 and to do a story that is like this is the send off for the Superman at this snapshot of a moment. And I keep referencing that it's looking at all the, these elements of it. So why don't we talk about the actual story itself? So it's set up in three parts. The first part is Lex Luthor hero, where (laughs) we follow Lex Luthor, where he let's be clear. This is a Silver Age Superman book. There is a lot of economy of storytelling and there's a lot of conveniences of storytelling in terms of getting from point A to point B at any given point. So Lex Luthor just happens to be in prison where he just happens to see what is clearly radioactive material in like the rock piles that people are breaking down with hammers. So he decides to punch a guard so that he gets moved from working the library (laughs) <laughs> to doing the manual labor of just generic, we're breaking rocks with hammers. <laughs> and he pockets some of this like clearly golden radioactive material that's glowing. And he's like, with this shit, I can cure cancer. And Perfectly <laughs> reasonable <laughs> premise. I don't see what, what we would mock about it. That, that makes sense. That stuff happens. That's, that's how science happens is from people punching other people and then digging stuff up that happened to fall into their laps. That is how the x-ray was found. That's how we got the atom bomb. <laughs> it's it completely makes sense to me. Yeah. Most genius breakthroughs come from people just working in quarries at prisons. Yeah. Or like apples falling on their heads. You know, just there's yeah. there's always someone someone will get hit by something and then science. Right. So it's this material called Element Z, which is this golden glowing stuff. And he convinces the warden to be like, yeah, just let me experiment. I swear I can cure cancer. Why not? <laughs> to their credit, they're like, no, that that's crazy. Like, you're clearly a villain who has broken out so many times every time we've put you anywhere near any kind of science stuff. And he's like, but could you possibly give up the chance for me to cure cancer? And they're like, well, fuck. Yeah, it's cancer. It's pretty bad. So with like guards holding guns to him while he's working on it, he comes up with a cure for cancer using this stuff that, that was just rocks that they had to the prison and <laughs> gives it to them. They go and test it. They're like, holy shit, it cures cancer. Oh, my God. Oh my God. <laughs> Everyone's excited about this. Superman's like, holy fuck. Lex Luthor cured cancer. So he flies into space and finds more of this meteor. So that cancer is just cured. Carte blanche. Like, just like every, uh, cancer's gone. <laughs> what I also love about this is this is a time in comics where a scientist meant a scientist of many disciplines because like Jay Garrick could be a chemist initially as the flash, but then also have a secret lab and Spider-Man can be a chemical expert who can create web fluid, but also an engineering genius who can make spider tracers and the mechanical aspect of the web shooter and Reed Richards could make almost anything the story needed, whether it was more about physics or biology, or chemistry. And and right here, like Luthor is, we don't have to learn what his PhD is in. If he has such a thing, we don't have to learn if he's ever had any experience in cancer research 
or medicine. He is just Luthor, genius scientist. Cool. So if it's science, yeah. he can figure something out. Yeah. Every scientist in comics is a multidisciplinarian polymath. Like, that's just the way it's going to be. <laughs> it's something to aspire to for all of us, honestly. Yeah. I mean, he never even encountered this stuff before. He's just like, oh, I see this stuff. <laughs> yeah. And based on its description, it matches what I had read about this thing that people had hypothesized existed out in space. And apparently it crash landed here. Which is a wild connection to make. Because I think there's a lot of things that I could say, oh, that sounds like that myth about the thing. I'm not going to say, hey, I bet that's the exact same thing that myth was about. There are myths about a lot of things. Yeah. <laughs> and I mean, it's it's right up there, honestly, with even as a kid, the original Superman movie with Christopher Reeve and Gene Hackman. Oh, when he figures out kryptonite. When he figures out kryptonite. <laughs> I could never, eight-year-old me could never understand, wait, he just read a newspaper article about a meteor that was found. And just from Superman saying what galaxy he's from, Gene Hackman Luthor thought, ah, this rock can weaken and kill him. I was like, well, what, how much was in that newspaper article about what the meteor <laughs> was? And if other people know it's radioactive, why is that guy in the newspaper photo just holding it? Yeah, it never quite makes sense. And I need to be clear when we're talking about the story. So first of all, the story is 25 pages. We, are, we have cured cancer for everyone. And Lex Luthor is now a hero to millions having saved countless lives. We are five pages in mm -hmm. counting the splash page on the front, <laughs> which is just a, can you believe the story that we're about to tell you about Lex Luthor being a hero and like him having a victory parade before the actual story starts. So in terms of actual story, we're four pages. All of all of cancer is gone <laughs> today. That would be eight issues. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> 12 if it's Bendis. Uh, <laughs> I wasn't going to say the name. <laughs> <laughs> so Superman, having assisted with curing cancer, goes to prison and sorry, not goes to prison, like goes to the prison, I should say, and appeals to the warden to say, like, look, Lex Luthor just cured cancer and I just brought a ton of material. That's pretty dope. We should let this guy go. It's exactly like the scene that they're parodying in Mystery Men when Captain Amazing shows up to talk out. Uh, what's his face? Blanking on it. The main villain. I know who you're talking about, but I've honestly not seen that movie yeah, in a not, decade. Yeah. It's like Bossa Nova Frankenstein yeah, or something, something like that. that yeah, or, but, doesn't matter. But the, the point is, we've seen this scene before, and this is literally like where that scene comes from. But played straight, where it's just Superman's like, yeah, Lex Luthor, f fuck, man. He saved so many people just now. We should give him a break. And so they're all like, well, a Superman vouches for you. <laughs> OK, so Lex Luthor then shows him his secret lair, which is a little vague here, where it's inside the Metropolis Museum. And it's got this like wonderful, like comic book element of there's a sign that says like this section to be demoed at some point in the future. And so no one just ever goes back there. And in there, he's got his lab to enter. You have to like shake the hands of a statue of Caesar. And then inside is like all these like infamous warlords th from throughout history. And he has Superman punch them all out because he's like, ah, they disgust me now. Ah, I'm going to sell this place and open up a real science lab. And at that point, I'm like, sell this place. I thought you just said it was like a secret layer inside the museum. Yeah, like, you don't own this property, bro. <laughs> You're squatting. <laughs> exactly. It's, it's so weird. I'm like, wait, you don't like it's always fun, especially like now looking back where like Lex Luthor has been so entrenched in pop culture as being a billionaire mogul kind of character right. since the 80s to like look back and be like, oh, right. Yeah. No, he was just like a dude who was smart, who would like sneak around back in the day. But then every now and then there'll be moments where like, oh, I guess he also kind of was rich because he was smart. So he could figure out how to be rich, too. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but here's where we get like one of those elements of looking back on the history of Superman comics. They describe the times that Lex Luthor, quote unquote, almost got him. And we actually see stories that had occurred back in the day, particularly the Bizarro story, like stuck out to me as being like, oh, yeah, that's that is exactly what happened. Obviously, it's not the first Bizarro, but it was a Bizarro. And that character has been a lingering threat for Superman at this point in the comics. Mm. And then the mob gets involved. And that's where the story breaks. <laughs> <laughs> this the museum thing. I kind of love it for, for two reasons. One, Luther, you're such a nerd. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, and I'm not knocking it because I, too, would love to live in a museum. But wow, you're such a nerd. But secondly, as ridiculous as it is, there is also a great character beat to see there. It's one of those wonderful things about writing that the author didn't necessarily intend it that way. But because it fits so nicely with the character, it comes off as layered to me, at least that he is shaking Caesar's hand. So 
to enter his lair, he first demonstrates that an emperor and I are on equal footing. And I rather love that. Luther has such an ego about that. I think that's great. Yeah. And I mean, like the secret lair is definitely dope. Yeah. Like we can't knock it at all. I mean, I currently have a sarcophagus lid behind me while, sure. while we're recording sure. <laughs> left over from a production of Joseph and the amazing Technicolor dream coat. So yeah. <laughs> absolutely. Definitely my kind of place, but definitely an ego trip for him. This wasn't like rich Lex Luthor. This is like normal everyday super villain Lex Luthor, right? This is Luthor. Yeah. As, as super villain, mad scientist, but also Luthor, who seems to have very specific wants of where he's going to spend his money because he needed to outfit that place. Yeah, it's like, because it says, it's like, uh, it says demolished at some future state. And I'm like, did he like buy it and just put the sign there so people wouldn't come around? Like he just specifically bought that part of the museum and told people, yeah. don't worry about it. <laughs> yeah, don't worry about it. There's nothing here. Don't worry about this place. Nothing to see here. <laughs> it's being demolished, you know. No super villain hiding here. <laughs> yeah. And then the money you spent to decorate that place and the tech that's in there. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's again, it's, it's one of those w- wonderful things about 50s, 40s, 60s super villains. <laughs> They're out robbing banks, but some of them are in such elaborate headquarters. It's like, bro, like how much money did you spend on just making a <laughs> penguin themed theme park for you to hang out in? You know, <laughs> like what? I mean, yeah. You wouldn't want to hang out at a penguin themed theme park. I think it depends on what the penguin are doing. <laughs> <laughs> that That is true. I mean, like this is again, this is played straight, a thing that we would see commented on in later comics. Yes. Like in Astro City, Kurt Busiek had a great story where basically a character who was out of jail was seeing all the different secret layers that all of his friends had and wasted all this money. And their families were like having trouble eating and destitute because they were putting all their money towards like their supervillain hideouts, <laughs> as opposed yeah. to like actually, you know, being responsible for the families that they had started to accrue over the, their career as supervillains. <laughs> yeah. And, and for some of them that completely makes sense. I have no problem believing that if the Joker robbed a million dollars out of a bank, he would immediately put two thirds of that into personalizing cars and vans <laughs> and a uh, new ha hacienda like that. That completely makes sense to me. Luther, I was just thinking maybe invest some of it. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe, yeah. maybe make a startup. I don't, all right. All right. I mean, maybe he did, but like it's, <laughs> it's all under an alias. And so he's accru- accruing money, but <laughs> sure, sure, sure. It's there as Alex <laughs> yeah, Thorle exactly. instead of Lex Luther. Yeah. 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 Some anagram of his name. But yeah, so then the mob shows up and they're like, dude, what the fuck, man? Like, you're now helping Superman. You were supposed to kill him. Yeah, <laughs> like that's that's not the deal. We're going to kill you now, man. And this goes into chapter two, which is Luther's super bodyguard, where because these mobsters keep coming after Lex Luthor, Superman starts behaving with him like he does with Jimmy Olsen. Like he gets him a signal watch at first and the mob keeps coming after him. And it's like all these moments of like that guy in the shadow. He has like what's clearly a blowgun. Uh, I better <laughs> hit the button immediately. And Superman flies in and eats the the dart that's coming to like poison him. Or it's like, oh, that's a grenade. Savage. Yeah. <laughs> and we should note that the mob is legitimately trying to kill him yeah. here. And it's like, oh, wow, I just barely pressed the button in time, which Honestly, this gets into that whole, like, with the speed of sound, regardless of what frequency, reach Superman in time for him to get there. Yeah. I mean, space is curved. <laughs> <laughs> That's just my explanation from anything. It's like, look, space is curved or, hey, man, the economy. Yeah. You know, it, <laughs> super hearing in this economy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It explains yeah. a lot. So Superman's doing his best to kind of keep Luther alive, but it's starting to get to him. He's like, I'm spending every minute just preventing this guy from being killed and he's talking it out with supergirl and they're like what what could we possibly do and he's like aha a satellite in space and she's like that's a great idea (laughs) so he builds a secret fortress in space for luther to go to flies him up to space and it's like yeah this will be awesome and then the mob so dedicated to murdering lex luther arranges for a surface to air missile to fly at the satellite and superman has to stop it and he's like all right well the satellite's not reinforced enough let's put the thickest plexiglass shield that could stop even a <laughs> hydrogen bomb around it so that that won't occur and also because you still might need my help but the hypersonic waves and so we know it's sound it's not like something else <laughs> will right. not be able to pass through space here is a signal flare rocket 
that is designed to look like you, Lex Luthor, like literally the rocket is in the shape of Lex Luthor. Like it's a statue of Lex Luthor mm-hmm. with like fins at the bottom and an exhaust area fired into our atmosphere. It will explode and that will be my signal for me to come rescue you. And he's like, all right, like you do science. You keep helping people, Lex Luthor. This is great. And he goes back to Earth and then Brilliant. immediately the rocket goes up. And it's like, oh, shit, <laughs> there must be something. The hatch is open for me to enter. And so he, he comes in and it's like, Luthor, what's going on? What's going on? And he's like, nothing's wrong here, Superman. For me, at which point he activates a kryptonite beam. All the police, but not for me. (laughs) (laughs) He activates his kryptonite beam and Superman goes down. And then in the next panel, he's then strapped Superman to a stretcher of some kind and is blasting him with more kryptonite. And that's when he reveals that he has kidnapped all of Superman's friends and they're forced to watch in like this. I wonder how did he do that, though? Because he's trapped in that spaceship. (laughs) Or he was in that spaceship. He is a man of means. Apparently, I don't know how he got the kryptonite. Exactly. <laughs> when Superman built the satellite. Like, how did he get any yeah, of this Superman stuff? built I, all his tech for him. Like, he built, yeah. like, the rocket, the spaceship. Like, you see him actually building the rocket on that one of those panels. His spaceship, he, he outfits the spaceship with the shield. And Luke is just kind of standing like, oh, thanks, dude. Really appreciate it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> So Harry, Lois and Jimmy are all forced to watch inside this like glass chamber as Superman just dies. Like it's fucking brutal. Whereas we were joking about how fast the story moved, the actual death process goes for like four pages (laughs) of just him being like bombarded with kryptonite radiation. And then that's it. He dies. And Luther like confirms that it's not a robot. And he checks and it's like, yep, he's actually dead. And then he takes the satellite rocket ship that Superman built for him. Drops everyone off on Earth and is just like, here's the body. I win. Bye. <laughs> <laughs> and the mob celebrates and Luther is victorious. Like he announces to the world, like, yep, I killed Superman, everyone. Ha. <laughs> and that's the end of part two. So much kryptonite radiation that he turned him green. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's brutal. Like he's he's lying there in pain, getting sicker and sicker over the course of panel after panel. And in addition to like the kryptonite beam, the buckles strapping him in appear to be kryptonite as well. They're like green, independently glowing like units. So he's like getting poisoned from all sides. And there's no like special thing that occurs, no interruption. Just he's out there in space. No one can hear like Supergirl's in the story. She couldn't hear. She's on Earth. She couldn't hear what's going on. He's in like a lead lined room. So like it's not like anyone could like look up and they're off in space and like just That's it. Like like the death trap worked. The scenes that we've seen a billion times at this point just worked. There was no getting around it. There was no like aha MacGuffin kind of moment. It was just (laughs) he's dead. And it's a pretty brutal sequence. And then we get the actual like death of Superman stuff. The morning of Superman. There's this huge public funeral with a glass coffin that everyone comes and pays respects for like he's fucking linen or something. (laughs) And this is where we get more of this appreciation of everything that has been done In the Superman world at this point, you know, we see Batman, we see the Justice League in general in the line for everyone. We see Lois with Lucy. We see all these aliens who've come for him. We see Linda Lee, Supergirl's secret identity show up. We get some like heartbreaking moments with Crypto where it's just like, I'll never have a master as good as you anymore. (laughs) True. We get Lana. We get Lori (laughs) Lemaris. The Legion of Superheroes come back from the future to like pay their respects the Superman robots in the Fortress of Solitude are like, ah, any of us would have given our lives for him instead. And in Candor, as an adult reading this, I was like, huh, this is actually really fucked up. Candor like pays tribute to him. They like have the flag at half mast. Superman's never going to come visit anymore. And I'm like, for a moment when I was rereading this today, I forgot that Supergirl would be able to like pop in on them. But I'm like, are they going to die? Like, are they yeah. just like <laughs> in? Oh, true. <laughs> No, no one. It's like you die in your fishbowl just as like, oh, eventually we're going to run out of air. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it is this community that is basically quite literally under glass and they must have some form of agriculture or something in there in their artificial environment. But yeah, it, if the power bill runs out of the fortress, does the oxygen just go off? Like what? Yeah. The, does the su- artificial sun die? Like what? Yeah. What, what happens there? And like clearly not really going to be an issue, but, you know, (laughs) it was a funny moment there. And we get stuff like, for example, the flag that they lower is the Krypton flag. So it's just we have built up all this lore about Superman at this point that we are paying some kind of tribute to. 
And then we see that Lex Luthor has a new base where he has commissioned artists. And he even says that he like paid artists to, like hustle and make like <laughs> a statue of Superman dying and <laughs> like a painting of Superman being subjected to the kryptonite beam. Getting back to like Lex Luthor, the egotistical man cave user, he like commissioned people with it days to like fill out his new place <laughs> with just art decorating him murdering a guy. Yeah, it's fucking wild, man. <laughs> At one point, what's the line between obscene and just self-satire at a certain point? <laughs> it was just it's it's so insane. But again, goes to that this whole thing is an ego trip and ego is eventually what does defeat him, even without Superman. Yeah. And then bursting through the walls, apparently, is Superman. I don't know why this sequence happens the way it does. Apparently, it's Superman. They're all like, oh, my God, it's Superman. And then immediately the person like rips off what is a disguise and it's revealed to be Supergirl wearing a Superman disguise. And I'm like, <laughs> why did she do it right there? Why? Like, it? <laughs> yeah, if, <laughs> like, if she's trying to throw them off psychologically, then let it go longer. Or, yeah, I, I half expected it to be a Superman robot. Exactly. That was a distraction mm -hmm. while Supergirl comes up behind them and, you know, does a thing. But it's just like, you know, I'll wear a disguise to freak him out and, and hide my identity. And then immediately before they even register it, show them, no, 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 it's it's someone you don't know. Right. And like she does it for all of them, like all the criminals see this whole thing. She's like, ha, no, like your bullets won't do anything. I have all of Superman's amazing powers. I arrest Luther like it would make sense to me if she had shown up disguised as Superman scares all the mob people there takes Lex Luthor away and reveals to Lex Luthor that she's Supergirl and not someone else. And also we should note at this time Supergirl was not a public figure. Nope. This is during the phase <laughs> where she was like Superman's secret weapon. She was training in secret. She was having private adventures with Superman and not known to the public as being a character. She would have her own like debutante ball later on where she would like become unveiled to the public. But this is a story where it's like being sped up a little bit because of Superman's death. He misses her quinceañera. <laughs> <laughs> so Supergirl takes Luther, takes him to Candor, where he is then put on trial for the murder of Superman. And he thinks that he's going to get off by making a deal to have them resized. I will say this is a spot where I'm like, wait, so they can just like kind of freely go back and forth exactly. with Candor. Yeah. That was my whole beef with this section because like Lois shows up, Perry White and Jimmy show up. I'm like, okay, so how did they get there? Like we skipped a lot of stuff. In yeah, in person. <laughs> we skipped a lot of steps. <laughs> like on a screen I could buy, <laughs> but they're in yeah, person like down they're, there. In they're there at the courthouse. <laughs> like, wait, could they have always left? <laughs> like, is it Roger Rabbit with the handcuffs? <laughs> I mean, and that was the thing that, that it got dressed with some stories later about, well, because Superman could shrink himself temporarily. And visit Candor, and it was this idea of there are forms of being able to shrink people to visit Candor, but the Candorians, because either how long they were shrunken or the different style of technology Brainiac used, whatever, were permanently locked here until you right. found some secret. But at the time, it's it's not even referenced in this story. It's it's just right. it's just yeah, <laughs> just you know, we're gonna hang out with them and and then simultaneously remind you that they're trapped here as tiny people in a bottle. <laughs> and so surely will agree to Luther's terms of let me go and I'll free all of you to be normal sized people who can, you know, colonize a new world. Yeah. There is one random panel in here where it confused me at the time. It very much looks like Ma and Pa Kent are watching a, a news broadcast about it. That's not them. It's not Ma and Pa Kent. It's just random people who are just like, oh, it's good that Superman's murderer is being convicted. But it seems like such a non sequitur if it's not, yeah, I thought that was <laughs> if it's not characters. Exactly. That's <laughs> I was like, oh, shoot, his parents in too. Get him. Right. They're dead. <laughs> They're dead at this point. <laughs> but yeah, so Luther, you know, tries to appeal to the Kandorian saying like, hey, I am so smart. I just cured cancer, guys. Like, what do you think I could do for you? <laughs> uh, and they're like, we don't make deals with murder, dude. We're putting you in the Phantom Zone and, they <laughs> and they put him in the Phantom Zone. And that's basically the end of the story. Supergirl is then flying around. They're like, well, we miss Superman, but it's nice that at least there's Supergirl out there. Crypto is just like Supergirl's my master now, which is just like a weird way <laughs> of he's so smart but so not a human at the same time. <laughs> and then, Alan, I was curious about this one. So they have the statue of like here lies Superman 
And I was curious because we were talking about this when we were looking at the world without Superman, which is that that statue of Superman in Metropolis just keeps showing up in Superman comics. <laughs> and like, clearly it's in whatever happened to the man of tomorrow. It's there. It's obviously in the Justice League movie. He just keeps dying. Do you remember where this appears? Is this the first appearance of that like Superman tribute statue? I think there might have been one earlier appearance of a statue in a 50s sort of story where Superman sees it as as a possible memorial and turns out to be a trick. But in terms of it actually being a signifier of Superman, whenever he does truly die, will have this statue like that's in some kind of a park is the first time that that sort of enters the canon. And it is fascinating that it keeps coming up in different ways. I mean, I would almost argue this is a better statue than what happens in the 90s when he dies. Because, I mean, the 90s statue is great because you've got Superman with the eagle, and I get it. Mm -hmm. And also just a bird of flight that's beautiful to look at, but can also mess you up if it needs to. That all, like, is poetic and, of course, Americana. But I think it's interesting to have this statue have the, the globe behind Superman because he is not just an American hero. In in universe, he's a hero of the world. Of every world yeah. they establish in this one. Like, he, all these aliens come to pay respect because he saves planet after planet. He's gone to all these wild adventures in the 50s and done good deeds for. Yeah. But he is a symbol of Earth, specifically. Like, even if he's Kryptonian, he is a hero from Earth who has gone out and saved this world and saved so many others so many times. Yeah, and, and in the 70s, there were a couple of comics, such as the first Spider-Man Superman crossover comic, which <laughs> reinterpreted his slogan to say truth, justice, and the Terran way. He's representing Earth as a whole and, and not necessarily their way of living, but the ideals of different Earth cultures. Yeah. And then we get like a little bit of a Mufasa moment at the very end as Supergirl is flying <laughs> through the clouds and she sees Superman in the clouds waving to her as she takes up his legacy. And that could be seen as kind of like a, an in story to like the canon of Superman. And then there's this whole disclaimer at the bottom where it's like, ah, can you believe that? Superman will never die. Totally an imaginary story. We'll come back next time. More Superman. Superman's the good stuff. <laughs> <laughs> and it's interesting that to me in the context of the, the comic book series at the time, the next story has an anniversary story of Superman and Supergirl considering the death of Krypton. So the next story, like you have Superman's death followed by an issue then that reminds you of his beginning rather than, than his end and of what the whole heritage is. They go through the origin of Superman and Supergirl and Krypto. It ends bizarrely with the two of them creating a memorial planet that's inhabited by robot duplicates of lost loves. And they decided they'll visit that every year, which just sounds so strange to me, but sure. And there's also in that same issue, 150, a story where Mixie's Pitlick makes everyone forget who Superman is. And of course, it's just, you know, this weird thing of like, he's trying to help people and everyone's like, well, who's this guy? And eventually he, he realizes what happened and he tricks the imp into reversing everything and going back home. But just that concept I thought was so interesting that you have a world without Superman in one way in 149 with the death of Superman. And then in 150, you have a world without Superman. They're not even aware if he died, they wouldn't be aware to mourn him. He's forgotten. I find it interesting that they had two of those stories quite so close together. Yeah. I mean, certainly stuff that Siegel is playing with because he's the, the writer on the next issue mm -hmm. as well. We're just kind of wrestling with it. And I wonder, looking at the timetable again, it's 23 years in. Superman has been such a huge pop culture phenomenon at that point that if there is a kind of a question of like, well, what would the world look like without this thing? Because like it's changed the nature of the medium of comics. It's changed the nature of storytelling. It, we're getting into the, the height of the Silver Age at this point, the rise of Marvel Comics. The radio show is long dead. The live action show is still running at this point, right? It was like late 50s. Yeah, it's like wrapping up. Was running. Yeah. 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 And you yeah, know, you're right. 1961. So we're we've got the Fantastic Four coming out this year. We've got the Hulk coming out next year. Spider-Man's next year, closely followed by Iron Man and the X-Men and the Avengers. Superman had already been in the past few years being restructured for a more science fiction atmosphere for the space race audience that we're hoping that America would make it to the moon, make it to the stars. 
And it was, even though Superman wasn't dying and wasn't necessarily in danger of being forgotten by the real world, like there, there was a sh- cultural shift that people were feeling. Yeah. So it's interesting to think of what the writer is ruminating on at this yeah. point when he's the creator of Superman. And there's so much happening that's a direct result of Superman's existence and how much that has changed since those early issues. Like what's interesting looking at this is that it's this big celebration of the status quo of Superman at the time, like this very dense, rich world of stuff that was going on. It's not other DC stuff. It's Superman stuff and the other DC characters just kind of live in it. Like the Justice League shows up in the background, but they're not even important enough yeah. to have like any lines <laughs> at the funeral. It's just I think Batman has one, but like that's it. Like no one else does. <laughs> Superman has such a huge, rich world, but it's not a tribute to like older Superman stuff. I mean, I guess when we get to like mix spit like in the next issue, there is something there and luther is also an old character but like kryptonite is a newer concept it, you know it can, comes from the radio show it's not even a thing siegel came up with although <laughs> there is like the whole k-metal story that like never actually got printed right so there you know elements there but like there's so much of this like larger world that had been introduced not entirely because of siegel's intent that had sort of like fleshed out the superman world and he is doing a tribute to all of that like all of that creativity that had gone into this character One of the interesting things that that sparks out to me, there's very little in the story that sort of reminds you of Superman's necessarily like his his effect in the world until he's dead. They don't show you like him doing a great thing or, you know, some other death of Superman stories will have him do an interview before high school kids or talk to certain people whose lives he's clearly inspired for the better and sort of remind you of that. And then he dies and it's like, oh God, we just looked at all these people who are proof that Superman makes the world better and now he's gone. And here he's actually doing sort of an average thing. His life is a little more busy because Luthor's situation, (laughs) but he's just doing his thing. And it's only until after he's dead that people stop to consider, oh, but he was so special. And that's actually perhaps more realistic, sadly, about all of us. Yeah. Along with that, there's no foreshadowing in terms of him reflecting on life or anything beforehand. There's certainly no, you know, Lois, I think it's time we got married or, you know, like maybe I'll retire (laughs) and we'll buy that houseboat that says everything will be fine. There's nothing like that. And then it happens. And I find all that very interesting. And I think even if that was not a deliberate decision of Siegel to approach death this way, I think completely makes sense for a man whose father died suddenly during an armed robbery when he was 17, which clearly had an effect on him and in part led to him changing along with Joe Schuster, the idea of Superman being in the initial, initial proto story, a sort of villain into a bulletproof man who protects people from bullies. Yeah. So I think there's something to that. I also, I find Superman in certain silver age stories, as much as I love them, Superman can be, on this pedestal of either being so, so good or also just being sort of your dad who just knows better. You might trick him here and there with something, but he's pretty wise. He gets the better of you unless, you know, you use robots or something. And here there is a very human reaction. I find in two parts of the story where when Luthor is being publicized as having cured cancer, Superman goes off to get him more of the element Z because obviously he wants to help him out. He wants to get these resources for more cancer treatments. At the same time, Superman in his thought bubbles is sort of saying, you know, they say anyone can change. I guess that's true of Luthor too. I like that it introduces that although he Superman sees the capacity of everyone for good, he doesn't necessarily expect it. And he is surprised and perhaps still on the fence about Luthor depending on the tone of what you, what does he mean by, I guess, Luther can change too. I think that tone is open to interpretation. And then later Mm -hmm. when he makes this secret laboratory, which is kind of nuts. And I love that this secret, like (laughs) space laboratory that completely isolates Luthor (laughs) from the world. He's trying to now help apparently. And Luthor's thanking him and shaking his hand. And this is all so happy. Superman doesn't just say, I'm glad the dialogue of Superman is I'm dot, dot, dot glad. And I just find that so interesting that Siegel doesn't further explain Superman's thoughts there. 
is he still curious if he's just given Luthor what he wants as part of some greater plan? Because this has happened before. Is he thinking, oh, well, that's great. I guess I am glad. I'm so used to being on the fence about you. But yeah, I'm glad that we're here. I'm glad that I can help you with this. I'm glad that we're on this footing. Is it I'm glad and I don't know what to feel about this. I don't know what to feel about shaking the hand of a man who for decades has tortured or attacked me and my friends who's tried to conquer the world and turned people against me and gone after my buddy Batman and stuff like it. It's <laughs> I find it so interesting that it, they don't tell you flat out what that means. Maybe he has doubts about Luthor, but he believes in hope. And so he's going to, carry this through on the basis of hope. He's going to give Luther that benefit of a doubt because that chance is worth chasing. And it turns out he's wrong about Luthor. Everyone was wrong about Luthor. This is a death trap. This was always a path <laughs> that Luthor was hoping if he could get it to the end would end in Superman's death. But does that make him wrong to hope? So yeah, on one hand, it's a silly, ridiculous, lots of holes to poke through story from the silver age but on the other hand there are those little moments that i find really fascinating and open to deeper thought yeah and a thing i want to really hit on is how mundane the death itself is like it's brutal yeah. but like you said it's a death trap just like a billion he's gone through it, this exact scenario has occurred countless times mm -hmm. with luthor or with anyone else and it just happened to work this time and I think what you said about Siegel in terms of like, yeah, death can just surprise you. And it's not a thing that's like it's not an earned death. It's not a good death. It's not a death you've built up to. It didn't go right this time. And just like up oh, and now he's dead. I think that's that tragedy where like at the end of the story, they're all like, holy shit. Like we never even thought that was possible. He didn't think it was possible. He thought he thought he was going to come out on top because he's Superman and he always has. And he doesn't die fighting. He's not getting a kid out of some nuclear holocaust and he was able to protect the kid but he died in the process he's not throwing himself between a kryptonite laser and supergirl and taking the bullet for her he walks into a room and he's there to ask how can i help and he's killed for it yeah like i said this is not a good death this is a death that should be in many narratives would be beneath our main character this is just walking to a trap and boom and then, as you pointed out earlier, it's not even a fast death. It's not Luthor hits him with a kryptonite ray that instantly kills him. It's not even a kryptonite bullet through the heart and he's dead instantly. The man who just cured cancer is killing him through radiation, radiation, <laughs> through a cancer like thing that's destroying his cells. And it takes him a while to die. And so he's aware of it. He's aware this is the end and I can do nothing. It's absolutely dreadful. And, and man, like, I mean, you talk about later stories or later movies about how groundbreaking they might seem for like, yeah, we went dark there. We went total like dark edge Lord with Superman. So like no one ever, this isn't your daddy's comic. <laughs> like we went like, look at this. This is effing dark for all the stuff that yeah. we're joking about for the Caesar statues and the museum layers. And the fact that mobsters would take, it as a personal offense that Luthor would help Superman as if there's, you know, a union brotherhood of <laughs> criminals that, you know, you're supposed to be loyal to or something. How dare he cure cancer? Yeah, they're annoyed. <laughs> he's curing cancer. <laughs> yeah. One of those mobsters has a sick aunt. Are you kidding me? Or a sick brother or something or has been sick. But you've got all that ridiculousness. You have. The Kandorians, who are delightfully tragic and silly themselves, this model city of survivors from Krypton. But yeah, it is a simple death and its simplicity is part of the brutality because it's also not a clever death. On first glance, it almost looks like a Bond villain death. I've strapped you to a table and there's a weapon yeah. above you. That's classic Goldfinger. But there's no elaborate thinking behind it there's no rube goldberg machine there's no multi-phase thing and even luthor's plan actually isn't that layered he didn't hire the mobsters as you pointed out to attack him those actually delayed his plan his plan was just i will do good things for a while to be let out and when i am let out i'm gonna have a room 
with the right equipment. I'm going to invite him over and he dies. That's kind of the plan. And then the death we get again, it takes a long time, but like Superman doesn't get to say anything. No. During this all. He's so weak. It's not like he gets to profess his love to Lois or say goodbye to Jimmy or Perry. Like it's just a painful watching of death in all its brutality. Again, it's not a good death. If you were playing a D&D character and you had this happen to you, you would like hit your DM. Yeah. Don't get any ideas, Case. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we've looked at Superman die a lot recently. We looked mm-hmm. at Superman Doomsday. We looked at the death of Superman animated. We looked at the death <laughs> of Superman comics in terms of like feeling like an earned death. Like, man, the animated death of Superman does a really good job there. You feel like, yeah, man, he got to stand up to it. He got to tell Lois that he loves her right before he dies. He got to like save her and he dies making a last stand to protect the woman he loves and the city he loves. Mm-hmm. And all of that feels really earned. And the monster is truly terrifying there. This is none of that. This is a dude. And in this timeline, it's a dude who he's known since childhood. He made the smallest of wronging in trying to do right. He tried to save him and destroyed his hair. <laughs> you know, the most petty of reasons <laughs> for all of this. And this person who he then takes that extra leap for. He gets him out of prison. He does all this stuff. And then he saves his life like crazy. And he's betrayed for it. And it's so terrible. And the tragedy is in almost how pathetic it is at the end. I don't mean pathetic in the sense of like, man, Superman sucks. Like, it's just this was going to happen to someone at some point. And the fact that is that it's a comic book. And so usually we get the hero to win and we don't get it here. And it's being allowed to move past act two in the perpetual second act of comics. And I think that's what's also really cool about this particular issue. The, the three act structure behind it. Well, not just the three act structure of this issue. If superhero stories are a perpetual yes. second act where you've done your origin story and then they just keep on having more adventures where the fun and game section of the sure. save the cat like clipboard structure sure. is still going on like every single issue. This we're actually allowed to have the story where like, yeah, they didn't just win because he happens to be the main character of the book. <laughs> well, yeah, eventually either you're going to deal with all your villains or your villains will deal with you. And in this case, the villain dealt with him and we get to see that version of that story and we get to see the reverses. So like I make comparisons with the Superman Red and Superman Blue story a lot, in part because that trade where I was first introduced are like back to back stories and there's some like shades of similarities. But that's one where he just wins, like he saves the world and he reforms all the criminals and sets Candor free, destroys all diseases, <laughs> gets to marry both Lois and Lana and start families with both of them. And it's not weird. No, it's not. <laughs> That's the dream. Not weird at all. Yeah. He gets to be two people. <laughs> so that's like the happy ending version of this but this is the sad ending this is where it's just sad and where it's just painful and annoying and there's not even glory yeah and there's not even a we discovered a vault of these things superman discovered right before death and with them we can do this or with them now we can make rockets for earth or this is you know there's no like well in death superman was still able to do one last good nope he's he's saved the sun yeah (laughs) <laughs> he's gone and he's left us and Supergirl's here and that's great. And other heroes are here and that's great. But Superman's gone. And it's again that pettiness also of Luthor because it's not even he convinced people he could cure cancer to get out of prison. He cured cancer. So Luthor can do amazing things to help the earth. And if he truly wanted to, could have been renowned, could have been wealthy beyond his dreams, but he doesn't want to, or he wants it on such specific terms. He's not going to get it the way he wants it. He, I'll cure cancer, but also I have to be in charge. I'll cure cancer and take us to the stars with rocket ships I've created, but also you have to love me and never tell me I'm wrong. And he couldn't move the needle on that. So he does this, his brilliant mind, and it just comes down to my greatest accomplishment was making a guy who thought I needed help die. It's actually not a very creative thing. It's actually like the most petty thing you could do. And also, I'm going to make your friends watch so that there's no possible way I don't get (laughs) credit for this. It's also, though, that pettiness. I love that it does limit him. There are other stories where he would have then gone on like a conquest and possibly been unrivaled. 
There are other storytellers who would have had like Batman, the Justice League try to stop him, but they didn't have Superman. So they just couldn't beat his robots or something. And he conquers America and, and like whatever, or like they get Superman from time travel or an alternate planet to come over. And that's what he stops him. Instead, what stops him is again, his ego. I thought I could blackmail people because I would give up my loyalty for survival. So clearly people must think the same way. No, Candor says, no, yeah, we want to get out of our bottle city, but you killed our friend. And he's genuinely surprised. Yeah, he's <laughs> incapable of seeing the nobility in others. In that regard, like yeah. while he correctly played Superman in that scenario, he didn't even see really what was special about Superman. Yeah, he's the genius who's so limited in his ideas. And it's something that you do see with, again, there's there's a weird, weird realism in this story because we see it all the time with actual criminals and corrupt politicians and such who actually can be geniuses with certain things or can know how to, even if they're not smart, they can know how to game a system. They can know how to game people, but keep betraying how limited their scope is that limited empathy really traps them in things. There's a great Columbo episode where he, I mean, many episodes, he tricks someone into showing that they're guilty, (laughs) but one in particular, because a person tried to blackmail someone else thinking that they would shut up in exchange for money. And the Columbo brings up, that was your mistake, thinking that other people thought like you. Because actually very few people think this way. And, you know, we see that all the time. And it's again, even with the death of Superman, you would think that there would be some operatic defeat of Luthor. And there isn't. He's put on trial. He tries to negotiate. And they say no. And they throw him in... Not just any prison where we know he would escape again. They throw him in the Phantom Zone, a twilight dimension (laughs) discovered by Superman's own father. So Superman's legacy maybe doesn't bring Luther's to justice exactly, but it does keep him from harming anyone again. The House of L legacy now makes sure Luthor can never harm anyone again. Yeah. And when the Kandorians sentence him, they say executioner. And like you think about it where it's like, it's a very comics code approved way of making a person a ghost, you know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, oh, it's the Phantom Zone. We're and also think, of, think about that. Like the Phantom Zone is kind of a hell. We refer yeah. to it as limbo and such, but it's really a hell because in the traditional idea of the Phantom Zone, you are still able to see and hear the real world, the main universe, but you're just moving through it like a phantom, unable to touch, unable to interact. So Luthor is going to wander around Earth's dimension And for God knows how long, we'll see people continue to mourn Superman while he becomes perhaps forgotten over time. The Legion of Superheroes are here. Heroes from the 30th century who are partly a team because of Superman. Mm -hmm. So at least for the next (laughs) millennia, Luthor as a spirit is going to see people remember Superman and try to follow his legacy. And no one's following his. And in a thousand years, because of time travel, he's going to see Superman again. When Superman, as a younger man, visits the Legion of Superheroes in 30th century, he's going to see him again right there. Yep. <laughs> he's going to be tortured yeah, at all. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> like, what a, what a hellish thing. Because of what? For ego? For pettiness? For needing love on your terms? Yeah. Like yeah. I said before, like, and like we've, we've all been saying, it's a ridiculous story, but man, it's actually got so many layers to it that whether you intended that or not, whether Jerry Siegel thought about it that deeply or not, it's there. It's really there. It's fascinating. Yeah. I mean, it's a sprint. It's 25 pages from cover <laughs> to the end of the story, but there's so much going on. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And it's crazy looking at it and seeing how dense a story could be and how many things that they could layer in there, even if there's so many contrivances and like just conveniences of how this thing is going to move quickly from this point to this point. But when it's time to linger on a thing like the death of Superman itself, like it lingers and it, it gives that space yeah. to breathe and be pretty painful. And that's why it's always like stuck with me. Like, I'm really glad for us to look back at this one, because, again, last episode, we were talking about the villain, which is a monologue I wrote, which part of the thought experiment there was that we don't really see what happens between Superman dying and Luther dropping off his body on Earth. And in my head, I was like, well, what would he say? And if he's the hero of his own story. And so I wanted to sort of explore that. And again, this is the issue that like really was in my mind when I was working on it. It was a lot of like just exposition about like 
what I was thinking about with Luthor in general, but like specifically this issue had always been on my mind. And I'd always thought about that sort of experiment right there. Like what is Luthor's monologue in that moment between those panels? Because there's so much that happens so quickly. It's crazy that there isn't more room to breathe in all those spots. <laughs> you know, again, we, we've seen those kind of monologues since then. Like we get the her sweet Lex Luthor Jr. giving the gotcha speech during the World Without <laughs> Superman arc when he returned Superman to his tomb. But it was fun to sort of explore that. And it's fun to like look back on this comic now because it, it's been a couple of years since the last time I looked at it, particularly because my copy is in the possession of oh, one J. Mike Falson. What are you talking, <laughs> about? What are you talking about, man? What are you talking about? nonsense. But I'm glad to look back on it. So, J. Mike, since you hadn't actually read this before, did you have any big takeaways that we haven't like kind of addressed? Like you've been characteristically and quiet. My head, <laughs> my head canon is that that was Martha and Jonathan Kent. And he wasn't the dad that told Superman not to save him from the tornado. That's my head cannon, and I'm going with it. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I was like, yeah, this was like, it was a very, like you said, a very short but a very dense story. I was not expecting this from this. I was like, how did he get all of that that entire wonderfully done monologue by Jeff, my Lex Luthor, part two? It goes, uh, <laughs> it goes animated series Lex, and then Jeff is next. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> I was like, how did he get that entire monologue from this? And I was like, oh, now it makes sense. Cool. I understand it. I get it now. But yeah, this is a good story. This is a very good story. I still don't understand why she took the costume off, though. <laughs> yeah. Like, <laughs> Five seconds into introducing herself. Fly Luther away and then take the costume <laughs> off. It's so weird. <laughs> Or just have the robots come bust out of doors while everyone's distracted. You snatch Luther and you're like, oh, God, what happened? He's gone. Uh, and also, they all know yeah. about the robots. So it's not like the robots are going to be a surprising quant. Like it, Superman busting through the wall is not a surprising quantity when they all know that he has robots flying all over the place. Mm -hmm. But this is all nitpicky stuff because it's just, man, fucking 60 Superman was weird. And if he died <laughs> in the most mundane and painful way possible, what would that story look like? And that th that's this like yeah, this, is, this is such a boring death. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, the person who invented the genre of superheroes gets to tell like the least epic, but ultimately the most tragic death that you could. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And again, it's just wild <laughs> that I mean, you compare that with what he wrote over two decades before with Action Comics one. And, you know, it's fast paced. Saving somebody from execution. Going from one thing to another, like we're opening up on here's a quick one page origin of Superman and why he can do what he can do. And second page, hey, we're going into the <laughs> governor's mansion because the wrong person is about to get executed for that crime. And a couple of pages later, hey, you're beating up your wife. You stop that. And a couple of pages later, hey. You know, bad. Lois, come on, let's <laughs> dance. Oh, no, mobsters. Like, and then throw in the mobsters car into the ground. Aha. And then like, ah, war profiteering in Washington, D.C. I'm going to mess with that guy. And then we're out. And it's like that high flying, high speed, but such grounded thing into fast forward decades of it's also densely packed, but feels like a slower burn. And. There's wilder ideas there. Like, as you said, it's some of those ideas came from Jerry. Some came from other writers, but he's welcoming them all. This is the Superman that is here now. This is not the character Joe and I made in the Depression era. This is a space age, truly deeper science fiction Superman. And I, as the architect who later also fleshed out some of his backstory and who later figured out some things about where he came from and the culture he came from and who raised him, da da da, da. I'm now going to picture that if he died, he would be what perhaps most of us experience of death, of just unexpected, not truly heroic, tragic, but still doesn't diminish the value that person had up to that point. And yeah. yeah. And what an opportunity to be able to do that, even as an imaginary story. Stan Lee never really wrote like a Death of Spider-Man story with Steve Ditko. And Jack Kirby sort of got to end the new gods, but not really on his terms. Certainly never did like a last Fantastic Four story. Like, yeah, it's it's wild that this story happened. Yeah. I mean, we're recording this. It's it's now May of 2023. The last couple of years have been. What are you yeah. talking about? Like, we, we, uh, <laughs> like uh, the economy is great. I mean, 
people people are being paid what they deserve, especially writers. Writers have never had it better. You know, the country is unified in a love of reasonable discussion and people are treated for no, I'm sorry. It's 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 all right. terrible. It's all it's nineteen thirty eight yeah. again. It's time for Superman again. Right. I mean, this is a day <laughs> after the Jordan Neely death on the subway. Like we are seeing gun violence. Like there's so many stories about shooters going off mm-hmm. and some of it. Sure. The news it gets sensationalized and we're, but it, you know, it's being reinforced and we, you know, we just came off of years of terrible, like tons of death that we've had to witness. Like so many people that have not had glorious yeah. deaths, that have not had noble yeah. deaths, have not had, had deaths that meant something. It was just someone got sick in the wrong space. And maybe they didn't have symptoms and went out somewhere and got someone else sick. And then that person died. And we all know someone who lost their life in the last couple of years because it's just been fucking gross. Like death is not a glorious thing. Death is not a noble thing. Death is a sad thing that oftentimes doesn't have like a thing that you can take meaning from. And it's. It's interesting that this is a story that they're trying to wrestle with kind of similar tones. You know, it's very easy to have like, here's the heroic last stand of someone like it's very easy to do the 300 Spartans at Thermopylae kind of thing and to have a death where it's honestly truer to life in the most bombastic, crazy comic concept world out there is really interesting to look at. And it resonates in a way that's different than all these other ones that we've looked at. You know, it was a long time ago we looked at whatever happened to the man of tomorrow. And like, obviously, there's a bit of a fake out in that all. But like there's like some pretty savage deaths that occurred that are kind of meaningless. And then there's also some noble ones like oh, yeah. crypto gets a really noble death in that story. And it hits you in a specific way. Like you feel moved, but also inspired. This one's not an inspiring death. This is just looking back and being like, man, it sucks to have lost this person. And I think that's a feeling that in this modern era, we're very acutely familiar with. And it's, it's wild to look back on this story from now I'm doing the math and it's 62 years ago. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's wild. But I'm really glad to look at this. If you're listening to this episode and you've never read it before, it is available on the DC Universe Infinite app. However, don't look for the issue. You will not find it because there's frustratingly yeah. this big old gap <laughs> of Superman comics from the Silver Age on the DC Universe app. It's got a bunch of Golden Age and then you jump over to the Bronze Age. It is, however, on the Superman 75th anniversary collection that is available on the app. I don't know why they don't just have the fucking issues, but it's there. It's been in several trades at this point. So the Superman 75th anniversary collection, the greatest Superman stories ever told, not Superman, the greatest stories ever told. Those are two different books that have different (laughs) issues in them, (laughs) as we have been forced to reckon with on this show. But it's readily available there. I've seen a bunch of videos recently that have discussed it, which is cool, in part because we are right now at the 30th anniversary of the death of Superman, like the doomsday fight story. So people have been looking at all these stories and that's kind of why we're talking about this anyway, but it's available. It's definitely worth checking out. It's a quick read. Again, it's 25 issues from the cover to the end. And I count the cover here because the cover and the first page effectively are both doing two different versions of like, this is what you're in for guys. (laughs) Like there's dialogue. There's a description of like in this issue, Superman dies. (laughs) And you see like the actual scene of Superman dying, (laughs) like on the cover, which is wild. (laughs) Like that was, that was just the issue. And it, it has the price. It's 10 cents. Here's 25 pages of Superman being murdered (laughs) in a pretty robust story, but it's available. I would say, check it out. Even if you have listened to this episode, have never read it. And you're like, oh, I know all the story beats because they talked for an hour and some minutes about it. So check it out. I think it's a really good read. Alan, again, thank you for coming on. Sure. Do you have any like closing thoughts about this that we didn't touch? I mean, I think you touched on it very nicely. I mean, that's the remarkable thing about good science fiction, good science fantasy of the stories that used to be called scientific romance. It's a great thing about fantasy and fairy tales and superhero comics in general is that you can have absurd seeming ideas and wrap your ideas up in all this lore of imaginary things and even straight up say this story will not have consequences because it is even in the context of our fictional universe an imaginary story you can say that and yet still talk about human things or show human things and maybe be more human than he expected to be when penning this the fact that it is 
simultaneously of the 60s of the Silver Age of comics and yet feels timeless because of how it approaches death and pettiness and villainy is remarkable to me. And yeah, you're right. A lot of us have lost someone in ways that we can't take any noble sacrifice from or any noble lesson from. It's just they were here and then they weren't. And I appreciate a story that can remind us about that and that it doesn't have necessarily an inspirational message at the end. Because Supergirl isn't standing proudly on some mountaintop with crypto saying, I'm going to be this amazing hero and I'm going to teach others how to be a superhero. She's not creating a school for superheroes with the lessons Superman taught her. She's just, I'm going to try to keep going. And it's it's yeah. a very lovely, quiet ending of like, yeah, that's what we all have to do sometimes. It was great to to chat about this. Jim, like any closing thoughts? This is a great story. I really enjoyed it. Great to see another piece of some good Superman literature without people hating on me so much. <laughs> <clears throat> but yeah, this is a good read. Everyone should go like read this as another piece of Superman literature to enjoy. He saved his father. Zack Snyder hates fathers. That's all I'm going to say. <laughs> you got that kryptonite axe to grind, man. <laughs> Yeah, so next time we are finally moving past the death and return of Superman cycle and all of our ruminations about that. So we are moving on. Uh, I think the next time we actually have a pop quiz episode coming up. We've, we recorded a bunch of episodes before I had a baby. And now <laughs> it's about a month after that, that being the birth of my mm. daughter. My brain is mush right now, guys. <laughs> so I'm sorry if the schedule has been a little <laughs> bit weird, but we've got a bunch of stuff banked. So that should not have any real interruptions, even if they're going to be coming out at weird times, because I'm just getting these out when I can. But thank you, everyone, for listening. Thanks, everyone on the call for being here to talk about the story. We've got more stuff coming. And if you are looking for other good podcast material, you can find stuff over at certainpov.com where you can find other great shows such as Another Pass, which I work on, or all kinds of other great shows like Screen Snark, which is a wonderful conversation about media that, Alan, you've been on. Former editor of this show, Matt Storm, and their co-host, Rachel Corky Shank, do a great job interviewing people and having a great time. So that's a really fun show. Definitely check that out. Again, you can find it at certainpov.com, where you can also find a link to our Discord server, where you can come interact with us directly. Alan, do you have any plugs that you want to give while you're here? I'm working on a few projects I can't really talk about right now. But for those of you who don't know, and most of you wouldn't, I'm also now working with a great company, Darkburn Creative. We make trailers for video games. If you've liked any of the Star Wars Jedi Survivor trailers, we made those, all but one of them, basically. The reveal trailer at TGA, the story trailer that came later, the last launch trailer, the gameplay trailer. It's a great game also. You can play it without having played Jedi Fallen Order. It's the sequel, but they give a little video at the top that you can understand everything and just jump right into it. I just work with great people, Tanner and Vincent and Sky and Sam, plus great folks such as Grant and Kyle and Hunter and Tally and Colin, Nick and Patrick, Ariana, Rhea, Maricel, Antonio, Matthias, Brooke, Danielle, Tony, Warren, Gus, my boy Serrano, Chris Rock River, Pete Ski, Charis, Jennifer, Chen, other Nick, Ian, Dylan, Susan, other Susan, everyone that I've maybe forgotten. I apologize for that. But yeah, it's it's a great operation. I'm lucky to be a part of it. And because I like plugging other people's work, I would suggest reading tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow by Gabriel or Gabrielle Zevin. I don't know how they pronounce their name, but it's great. Speaking of reading, I should plug this one since it just dropped. Uh, the book Voices of Krypton, which is an oral history of the history of Superman by Ed Gross, who has previously done all kinds of ones. Uh, the one that I was most familiar with was uh, The 50-Year Mission, which was a oral history of Star Trek. That just came out, and I am referenced in there as one of the sources, which was pretty dope to see my name all along this whole list. Like, I'm right above Kirk yes. Allen, the first actor to ever play Superman, which is, like, so fucking cool, because alphabetical order in terms of the <laughs> the list of people contributing. But I, I was really happy that I'm, like, actually in, like, a decent amount. I was like, fuck, yeah, nice. So if, if you 
you want to see my words written, they're there, along with way smarter people who actually know what they're talking about and not just all that. <laughs> so, again, Voices from Krypton, it's out. There's actually a lot of podcasters on there. So if you're just a fan of Superman podcasts, a lot of people who have been in the fan community got a chance to speak up about the character. So check that out. It just came out this week that we're recording and theoretically the week that this episode is dropping. We'll find out how that goes. We'll see. <laughs> but check all that out. And until next time, stay super, man. Men of Steel is a certain POV production. Our hosts are J. Mike Folson and Case Aiken. The show is scored and edited by Jeff Lunen. And our logo and episode art is by Case Aiken. Hey there, Screen Beans. Have you heard about Screen Snark? Rachel, this is an ad break. They aren't Screen Beans until they listen to the show. Fine. Potential Screen Beans. You like movies and TV shows, right? I mean, who doesn't? Screen Snark is a casual conversation about the movies and television shows that are shaping us as we live our everyday lives. That's right, Matt. We have a chat with at least one incredible guest every episode, hailing from all walks. We've interviewed chefs, writers, costumers, musicians, yoga teachers, comedians, burlesque dancers, folks in the film and TV industry, and more. We'd be delighted for you to join us every other Monday on the Certain POV Podcast Network. Or wherever you get your podcasts, fresh and tasty off the presses. What? But that's no, that's not. Can I call them screen beans now? Fine. Screen beans. So tune in and we'll see you at the movies or on a couch somewhere. Cause you're a whole screen beans now. You will be mine. Aurora. CPOV. Certainpov.com.